They would re-aim the big deck gun back into the side of the boat to try to what we call a polar. After 1945, the world plunged into Cold War. During these years of icy tension, submarines went through a radical evolution. Now, they are on the front line of nuclear Armageddon. The Cold War is a 45-year-long confrontation between East and West, and submarines are the one way that confrontation is played out at sea. Both sides' submarines are playing a long-term cat-and-mouse game with one another, trailing and following one another's boats in a game that is a preparation for a war that they hope to prevent. With the advent of nuclear fusion, torpedoes would be overtaken by larger, more powerful weapons, nuclear ballistic missiles. Given their size and the need to launch them vertically into the air, a new generation of subs would need to be designed and built specifically to carry them. The ancestry of these missile-carrying submarines goes back to World War II. With the war going badly for Germany, Hitler ordered the development of revenge weapons to reverse Germany's fortunes. Designed by genius engineer Werner von Braun, one of these weapons was the long-range B-2 rocket. With this new technology, the Nazis planned a daring attack. Well, one of the problems for the Germans was that they couldn't threaten the Americans. And so the idea was that if they had this wonderful weapon, the, the V2, by putting it inside a, a towed body behind a submarine, they could sneak it across the Atlantic. And with perhaps not particularly precise navigational accuracy, but they could certainly attack an American city. The war ended before the Nazis could put their plan into action. Werner von Braun joined NASA and developed larger rockets that would ultimately carry men to the moon. After World War II, relations between the United States and the Soviet Union cooled fast. The two former allies competed in an arms race with each side trying to get the upper hand. The Americans took an early lead. By reverse engineering captured German rocket technology, the U.S. developed the first practical submarine-based rocket system. Fired from the deck of a submarine, the Regulus missile had a long range and packed a nuclear punch. The development of the Regulus missile was originally envisioned as a nuclear-tipped missile. She was a cruise missile that could be launched from uh, submarines. Basically what would happen is a submarine would have to surface. They would then, in these two compartments which were watertight, remove the missile, do some uh, final assembly, and then launch the missile. The Regulus missile was basically what the cruise missile is today. It was a guided missile. In other words, we fired it, but either we would guide it to the target electronically, or if we fired the Regulus missile to a very long-range target, there would be another submarine that had the capability of picking up that missile and guiding it. The submarine would have to surface and ready the Regulus missile on the deck. All this took time and made the sub a sitting duck. And when we surfaced, we had seven minutes to fire and then to merge. But that's seven minutes you're, you're vulnerable to, uh, uh, to attack. The line that links Nazi rockets with the Regulus is still with us today. Tomahawk missiles fired from submarines are now a major part of the U.S. military arsenal. We can basically go off somebody's coast and at a moment's notice uh, launch a series of Tomahawk cruise missiles taking out key communication centers, command and control nodes, all of those things to basically pave the way for the rest of our Navy to come in and do what they need to do. It didn't take the Soviets long to respond to Regulus. They put to sea submarines that fired ballistic missiles from inside their hulls. They had to surface to fire, but theoretically, the Soviets could park their subs next to American cities and attack without warning. These missiles could not be fired from a dive submarine. You had to surface and jack the thing up and then fire it from the top of the fin. But nevertheless, they did it.
The new Soviet ballistic missile firing submarines were a serious threat. And by the late 1950s, the Cold War looked set to go into deep freeze. The U.S. had to respond to the threat. They needed to find a way to deter the Soviets from launching a devastating first strike. Their solution? To put nuclear missiles to sea on a nuclear-powered platform that could fire them while submerged. Undetectable and therefore indestructible, with these boomers off their coast, the Soviets knew that a retaliatory strike was guaranteed. Now, a hot war would result in mutually assured destruction. The fact that that weapon is so powerful is a major deterrent. It kind of bottles up your enemy, makes them think twice before taking any type of aggressive action. A new, larger family of submarines needed to be built to accommodate nuclear missiles. U.S. Navy designers stepped up to the plate and began work on the first submarine to carry the Polaris nuclear missile, the USS George Washington. Designed and built in just three years, the George Washington Polaris combination was a miracle of engineering. And it is remarkable that this weapon system was conceived, designed, built, tested and entered into service in a really remarkably short time. The breakthrough was how George Washington fired its missiles while submerged. Using pressurized gas, the missile was ejected vertically from its firing tube to the surface. Then the solid fuel propulsion system fired using the surface of the water as its launch pad. The George Washington fired the first Polaris nuclear missile from under the surface of the ocean in 1960. Two years later, it proved its worth in the Cuban Missile Crisis. George Washington-class submarines were deployed in the Caribbean. Their presence helped persuade the Soviets to back down. The purpose of the submarine was the same as its purpose is now, to dissuade attack. You are the ultimate demonstration of the political will of the country to be defended. Some say that nuclear missile carrying subs are the most successful submarines in history. They fulfilled their brief to the letter. Nuclear war never broke out between the superpowers. Experts put that down to the deterrent effect of the nuclear sub. If we can win a war by never having to fire a single shot, then we've done our job. And for ballistic missile boats, that is the ultimate measure of success. That we go to sea and we come back with all our missiles still on board. Nuclear technology delivers one hell of a punch. But harnessing nuclear power to propel the submarine would also enhance its capabilities beyond anything that had gone before. Fleet exercise after fleet exercise, Nautilus was just dominating those exercises and it really proved the tactical advantage that they provided. No matter how deadly the sub, it can only be effective if it can get to its target quickly and quietly. The first submarines had to be powered by the men inside. Earliest submersibles are propelled only by human muscle power, and this creates severe problems. It's very demanding work indeed. The air becomes increasingly foul, and they are very slow-moving vessels indeed. A new form of propulsion was needed that could keep the sub fast on the surface, but also had the legs to make it effective underwater. It would take a hundred years before someone married the greatest inventions of the 19th century with the submarine. His name was John Philip Holland. John Holland was born in a period of great technical change. He was surrounded by people who had produced the key elements of a submarine. The battery had been known about for some time. The electric motor had been invented some 40 years beforehand by Michael Faraday. And the idea of a torpedo, a usable weapon, had been invented by Whitehead. The final thing to be invented